this is Jason Key from SB Grid uh, from uh, Harvard Medical School in Boston. Today I'm in Auckland at the uh, Asian Crystallographic Association meeting. So, uh, webinar from uh, the other side of the world today. Um, uh, today uh, we're lucky to have Nick Pierce joining us from Utrecht. Nick's going to talk to us today about PANDA, ligand binding uh, protein states from um, conventionally uninterpretable crystallographic electron density. So um, that's a subject that's been discussed quite a bit here at uh, uh, the crystallographic meeting. And uh, Nick, are you there? Hi. Great. Yeah, go right ahead. Great. So thanks very much for inviting me to give this uh, talk. It's not a, often that I actually get to talk about how to use the software. Normally just get to talk about uh, the underlying science. So this was quite a interesting exercise, but give it a go. So presumably this slide is fine. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about my my PhD work actually, which is uh, a couple of years ago it, we finished it and it came out last year, um, which was on uh, using multi data set analysis uh, to identify ligand bound protein states from crystallogra crystallographic data sets. Um, going to start with a brief introduction into ligand identification and crystallography, some of the problems that we have. Uh, then I'm going to move on to uh, the origins of PANDA, which was the, the analysis of crystallographic fragment screening data, uh, predominantly identifying binding hits or events, and then trying to visualize those bound ligands and build models for them. Uh, and the second half of the talk is going to be on how to actually use the software, uh, particularly running it. Uh, but also then once you've run, soft, run PANDA and got your ligand bound models, how do you model, uh, refine, and then validate those partial occupancy ligands? So X-ray crystallography, determining uh, protein ligand structures. Uh, when, we, when we want to see our ligands bound to our protein, uh, typically what we do uh, is perform a soaking experiment, or at least what can be done is we perform a soaking experiment, take a preformed protein crystal, add a ligand. Uh, if the ligand binds, it appears in the density. Uh, of course, if it does not bind, then it won't appear in the density. But the problem is, if the ligand doesn't bind, we've always got to remember that something else will. Uh, and because crystallography records an average, sometimes those blobs can be a misleading shape, even if they're caused by something completely unrelated to them. So for instance, in this case, we have an ethylene glycol uh, bound in the binding site of the protein, um, and then some other unexplained density that we, we have no idea what caused it. Um, but if your ligand adopted was a particular shape, you could possibly misinterpret this density as your ligand. And the, the reason this is a particular problem is that there are a lot of blobs in uh, crystallographic data sets all over the surface of our protein. Um, we, 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 we see blobs. And so what we want to know now is which blobs are my ligand and how do I model my ligand? Um, this is made even worse by the fact that, as I said before, our, our crystals are heterogeneous. They, they contain uh, multiple protein states. So here, taking the facile example that we have, uh, the unbound state of our protein, which is a dog, and then we have the bound state of our protein, which is a cat. Uh, so in this case, the ligand isn't even present in all of the proteins in our crystal. Uh, so when we average over these, we get a weighted average of the states, and our, our, our interesting uh, cat confirmation is, is drowned out by the noisy dog confirmation. Um, and as I said before, if you fall into the trap of trying to uh, interpret density, which is not real, um, the, the problem you can get is that you can get very weirdly distorted cat ears and very weirdly distorted cat whiskers. To take a more contemporary example that hopefully will be a, suitable for an international audience, um, the slides were mainly made for a presentation in America. If we use an example from the uh, musical Hamilton, we have here two patriots adopting different states. One is raising a glass to freedom. And the other one is preparing to raise a glass to freedom. If we do exactly the same, experiment and have a crystal where we've got 20% of one state and 80% of another state, calculate the weighted average. What we observe is a very, uh, very strongly dominated by the, the ground state of the patriot. You can maybe vaguely see the, the, the glass domain uh, and the arm domain have been raised, um, and you might be able to model those, but what you almost certainly would miss is the kind of the conformational change uh, in the torso uh, domain uh, that's correlated with the glass raising event. So these are the problems that we have in crystallography. Uh, and they can lead to, to two things. They can lead to false positives when we're analyzing uh, ligand data. And they can lead to false negatives. 
So false positives are where we look at a blob, model it as a ligand, but it's actually wrong. And then a false negative is where the ligand binds, but we miss it. Uh, how do false positives come about? Well, if we have two states in our protein of some, of some waters, for example, and half the crystal, three waters adopt one conformation, uh, and the rest of the uh, crystal, they adopt another conformation. But when we uh, average over those states, we might accidentally interpret their average as a weakly bound six-membered ring. The, the second case, which is false negatives, um, if we have a ligand that binds at partial occupancy, the rest of the crystal is uh, occupied by some solvent molecules. We observe an average over this, uh, and we can get a density map like the one on the right. Um, you would hopefully never interpret this as a ligand, but you certainly wouldn't interpret it as this ligand. Uh, however, during this talk, I'm gonna hopefully convince you that there is actually a ligand bound here, um, and this is the correct pose. And it's about 25% 20, 20 occupancy. Uh, what are the traditional methods for identifying ligands in electron density? Uh, we have two principal me uh, methods. The first is a standard difference map. So we take our, our experimental data and we subtract off the bits of the electron density that we've already modeled by our, normally our protein. Uh, and you can quite clearly see on the right-hand side that the, the bit we've not modeled, i.e. the bound ligand, uh, really strongly appears as a, as a different uh, feature. Um, the problem with this is that it is reliant on our model. So I showed earlier uh, that when the ligand isn't bound, there's an ethylene glycol uh, in the binding site. So I've, here I've left the ethylene glycol on the waters in the model um, from, a, from, a, from another data set, you just transfer the model in. And then if you subtract this one, you end up completely destroying your signal, which is the features in the difference map. So therefore, if you, if you forget to remove waters from your model, you may no longer detect your ligand. Um, the other technique used to identify ligands in uh, crystallographic maps, which is a little bit old fashioned, but uh, nonetheless works, uh, is called an FOFO map, where you, instead of subtracting the model, you in fact subtract the, uh, the, the electron density, in this case, just the straight observed uh, map from your reference data. You subtract a reference map from your uh, ligand bound data set and you can quite clearly see the difference features between the data sets. So in this case, you're using this as a control experiment to test whether this contains an interesting feature. And it works very nicely. In this case, it's not affected by the model as before, but it still doesn't look like the ligand because it's just showing us differences between our data sets. So the, the advantages and disadvantages of both of these uh, methods, uh, difference maps can only really identify high occupancy ligands that display enough uh, difference density. Um, if you forget to remove atoms from your model, then you can completely destroy all of your signal. Um, even if you obtain difference density, it might not look like your ligand. In this case, it does, but it's not always guaranteed to, uh, because we have an average over multiple states, potentially. Um, and, and most importantly, the difference map is not actually an indicator of signal, only of density. It, all it says is, in the crystal, there are electrons at this position. It does not tell you that it's your ligand. Isomorphous difference maps, however, can detect low occupancy ligands because they, if your uh, reference data set is very, very good, and even a small change will be marked as significant. Um, but as, as I just said, they do require a, a good reference data set, in this case, a highly isomorphous data set um, that you compare to, so one with a very similar unit cell. Uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, isomorphous difference maps have the problem that your density still might not look like your ligand. However, they are a measure of signal um, if you have a suitable control data set, which is a feature that it would be very, very nice if we could keep in a signal identification method. But most importantly for me, neither map is suitable for modeling partial occupancy ligands because we might always observe a superposition of your ligand and some other state of your crystal. And neither of those methods does anything to try and overcome these problems. And then the uh, elephant in the room, I like to think, is the problem that we are all humans. Um, it, it is recognized that we are all humans and that therefore we are interpreting this data um, and we are looking for bound ligands. And we therefore uh, run the risk of confirmation bias where we see a blob that looks like our ligand and because we're modeling it, we, because we're looking for a ligand and we want the ligand to be bound, we end up modeling a blob that we really shouldn't. And then we find ourselves uh, making excuses such as, well, why, why is the density there? Well, 
my, my ligand ex exhibits weak density, um, or you might say, oh, it must be present in multiple conformations. Uh, and then, of course, the ultimate one, which is very dangerous when it gets said, but I know the ligand is bound, so therefore it's bound in the crystal, which of course isn't always true. Um, one very, uh, re well, fairly recent example, now two years ago, actually, um, the kind of the extreme example is, is this paper by Stanfield, Pesarsky and Rook, um, where they investigate a few PDB structures that contained a peptide that did not seem to be actually present in the electron density. Um, and that kind of led to a, an argument in the literature about how we should interpret difference maps. Um, I'm not going to go into it, but nonetheless, the methods uh, that identify ligands in electron density are kind of still subjective. People decide what the appropriate contour level you are allowed to look at is. Um, so, we, so we have a few problems there. So this then was the, pretty much the situation during my PhD when I was working on fragment screening uh, by X-ray crystallography at Diamond Light Source in the south of England. Um, very quick introduction to fragment screening for those who don't know it. When you're looking for a drug, um, you, you want to find a molecule that binds to your protein. You can either start off by screening a very large, uh, you can start off by screening very large molecules against your protein to see if it binds. Um, you then kind of search for a high affinity hit and try and evaporate it into a drug. Because your molecules are already very large, you need to explore a large amount of chemical space. You need uh, hundreds of thousands or possibly millions of molecules in your, in your library. And this obviously takes a lot of work. Um, fragment screening, on the other hand, you start off with a library of very small compounds. You then look for them and hopefully they bind to different parts of your binding site, for example, and you can even link them together chemically. Um, and, but because these are small, you can have a much, much smaller fragment library, so maybe 100 or 1,000 molecules, uh, and still efficiently sample chemical space. And, so the, and this is what uh, we were doing at Diamond Light Source, um, and we're looking at kind of compounds of about 10 atoms, so they only bind very, very weakly to your protein, uh, hence the partial occupancy issues that I've been mentioning all this time. And what do you do with a, with a fragment hit once you've identified it? Well, I, uh, Preferably, you solve the crystal structure of it, and then guided by the other residues in the binding site, you can um, figure out which are the best kind of chemical elaborations and modifications you can make, and hopefully work your way from an initial kind of weak uh, binding compound all the way up to a very, very potent uh, optimized lead. And because you're using structural information, it's kind of so-called rational drug discovery. Um, so I, I was based in the SGC in Oxford. Uh, we're collaborating closely with Diamond Light Source, and this project was very much a very close collaboration between the two groups, uh, who are in fact led by the same person, which kind of explains why they're very, very close. Um, and you can imagine that this kind of requires a lot of work. We're talking about generating hundreds uh, and thousands of crystals of the same protein in the same crystal form, then dispensing fragments into each of these crystals, harvesting all these crystals, collecting data from them, and then analyzing the data. Um, this unsurprisingly is a whole talk on its own, so I'm only going to talk about the analyzing the data today, but I would highly suggest that anyone interested um, goes to the uh, uh, Diamond Light Source uh, XChem page, as the project is called, or you could probably also just Google XChem TLS. So that, that brings me neatly to Panda. Um, we were initially at the beginning of my project confronted by this, this mountain of data. We have, like I said, 200 to 1,000 crystals each of which contains a different protein, uh, a different compound, sorry, one second. That's what happens when you have automatic lights in your room. Uh, so we have 200 to 1,000 crystals. Uh, you add a different compound to each one. You then collect a full crystallographic data set from all of them, from each of them, in fact. You solve all the structures, and you determine the binding ligands. Uh, we, we try to recognize that, actually, if you if you follow this traditional procedure, you're treating each of these as a separate experiment. Uh, and what we wanted to do is, in fact, combine them all into one experiment and hopefully identify some more ligands. This is the schema of the of the, the algorithm we came up with, which is called Panda, which is Pan Dataset Density Analysis. Um, you take all of the maps from the different data sets and you align them. You then sample the electron density at the same point in every data set. You build distributions of the electron density at that particular bit. You characterize these distributions, and you spot outliers. 
And if it's a strong outlier and there's kind of a lot of outliers in a particular region for a particular data set, then this normally signals a binding ligand or another interesting thing has happened in that crystal. And what we also recognize was that most of our fragments in our fragment screen don't bind at a particular location. So you have a lot of observations of um, the kind of the ground state of the crystal, which is what happens when the ligand doesn't bind. So in this case, it's maybe five water molecules. Uh, and by averaging over all the unbound data sets, we get a very, very clear picture of what the background looks like. And even though we've identified our ligands, which, may, which bind at partial occupancy, um, we still can't model them because they're a superposition of two states or more states. But because we know the background, if we can, correct, if we can calculate uh, the approximate occupancy of our ligand, we can subtract off a weighted fraction of our background and reveal uh, only the density for the ligand. So we're effectively removing all of the unbound proteins from the crystal. It's one way you can think about it and pretend, and we're simulating what would happen if the ligand was bound at full occupancy in the crystal. Uh, the statistical model underlying this, um, not going to go into it in too much detail, um, is a very simple model. And in fact, we're going to be doing more work on it in the further months because it's uh, there are corner cases at low resolution where it just simply breaks down. Uh, so we need to generalize it. But in the the essence of the model is that we have the observed density at a particular point in a particular data set has some kind of average across the crystal. So there is kind of a, an ideal crystal that we could view. Um, but each data set has an error associated with it due to, uh, for instance, experimental error. Uh, and then a variation uh, at each point as well. And so if you can imagine that the crystal contacts uh, regions in each crystal are not necessarily the same. A small crystal might actually look a little bit different to a large crystal due to the way it cools, et cetera. And this uh, allows for variation between data sets at a particular point. The important thing about this statistical model is when we invert it, we can calculate a series of Z scores. So how much does this data set uh, differ from the average uh, divided by a few noise terms? And what these are, uh, they lead to Z scores, which are an objective measure of signal in your crystal. How interesting is the electron density at this point in this crystal? To, to go back to the example I uh, promised I would prove was correct. Um, so this is the correct ligand pose, which I'm asserting. Um, and this is the 2FOFC uh, experimental density. It's contoured at a very low level because it's uh, quite a diffuse region of the protein. You would never normally model into this. But if I calculate the Z map, you can uh, quite clearly see at the plus or minus three sigma contour that there's a very nice peak here for this fluorine, for example, uh, and some other nice features that starts to look a bit more ligandy. However, this doesn't solve all our problems. Um, we, we can now identify where interesting things have happened, but we ha still haven't revealed uh, electron density for our ligands. The full data set still shows a complex superposition of states, so that is uh, really of no use at all. Uh, and the Z-map only shows, shows differences uh, between this data set and the reference data set. So again, it doesn't reveal the uh, density for our ligand. So the next thing we did, uh, the next thing we have to do, in fact, is uh, to subtract the superposed ground state in order to reveal clear density for modeling, as I mentioned earlier. To demonstrate this, I'm going to iteratively subtract off uh, increasingly weighted fractions of the background, and you'll see these two ligands suddenly appear in the density uh, once the correct amount of background has been subtracted. So this ligand on the left is bound at a slightly higher occupancy, so it appears about 0.3. Uh, and this one is much lower, so it appears at kind of somewhere around 0.1. You'll notice this one is significantly noisier because it's much lower occupancy, but actually these two ligands are bound in the same crystallographic data set, just at different sites. So if we can estimate how much of the background to subtract, we can very, very clearly reveal which ligand, uh, sorry, which ligand, how the ligand is bound in our crystal. Um, I'm not going to go into depth how we do this, but basically we try to contrast, uh, we try to maximize the contrast between the event map, which is the subtracted map, and the original ground state map of the crystal that we already had. Um, we use absolutely no information about the ligand that we're looking for. Uh, and if you use this automated method, then it kind of very nicely and very repeatedly gives you really beautiful clear density at now what is a very, very high contour level. Um, we, we've run this on many, many fragment screens, and what you always kind of see as a common feature 
So you have your, your normal 2FOFC here and in the green your FOFC showing that maybe there's, there's something that needs modeling here, sure. Uh, the ground state of the crystal in this case is still quite clearly defined, so there's an ethylene glycol and a couple of waters. You scroll down, you still go get no really extra information, uh, but as soon as you calculate the Panda event maps and the Z maps, you can, you can quite clearly see A, where your ligand is and how it's bound, uh, but also confidently interpret the electron density without having to worry about these superposed states. And we ran this on data set after data set, and what we, we notice again and again and again is just how easily these things jump out, even where there was absolutely no uh, experimental uh, indication, I should say wrong, experimental, there's no indication that these are bound in the conventional maps. Some summary statistics, uh, we've, again, these are just the three uh, that I focused on for a short period during my PhD. Uh, we had to, these two were done manually by a PhD student in the group. Um, he initially went through the data sets and identified maybe kind of three, two, three fragments here and two fragments here, so hit rates of one and a half, one percent, seemingly very reasonable actually for a blind screen. Um, however, when we ran Panda on it, we uh, significantly increased the hit rate either by a factor of three or a factor of ten. And for JMJD2D, the data set here, um, the ligands really did bind all over the surface of the protein. So that very much excited the chemists about the, for the uh, opportunity to explore things like allosteric binders. Uh, and for the people interested in low resolution, we ran it blindly on uh, this data set, meaning we didn't do a manual inspection, uh, and we managed to get a 21% hit rate, which is actually kind of ridiculous, uh, with the lowest ligands that we found being about 2.7 angstroms. And I just wanted to underline again that I have not used any information about which ligand is present when looking for these sites. So these are entirely, uh, the maps that are generated are generated objectively with absolutely no uh, idea about what it's looking for. All it's doing is looking for differences and then calculating the event map to maximize the difference uh, to the ground state map. I'm gonna go through a few examples very quickly. Um, so this is the standard maps in, a, in one of the binding sites. Um, there's an ethylene glycol present in the ground state and some several waters, uh, and this green blob that I actually showed you earlier. Um, this ligand doesn't fit into this density at all. If you calculate the panda maps, so the Z map and the event map, there's a very, very strong peak here, um, which could possibly kind of be, have been the sulfur, but the shape of the ligand doesn't match the data set at all. Uh, so there's possibly a pipetting mistake here, because if you look two data sets down, um, you can identify this ligand, which has a very, very nice bromine, um, which beautifully fits into the density. And in fact, if you calculate the anomalous difference map, we can pretty much confirm that the bromine is present at this site. Um, so we are able to identify when there's been a pipetting error, or in this, or possibly also a labeling error in the library. Uh, this, this is a particularly beautiful example. Um, the, the density on the left-hand side is the conventional 2FOFC maps and the FOFC maps, uh, and it just looks like a mess. So this is contoured at one sigma. The, the structure that I've left in here is the ground state. So this is the APO state of the crystal. Um, and, but there's absolutely no, no way you could figure out what's gone on there or in fact model it. If you calculate the panda maps, however, you can very clearly remodel the protein and identify that the ligand is bound in this new uh, binding pocket. To, to see more clearly what's gone on here, the, uh, one of the helices on this protein has swung open, so this is the C-terminus, uh, has swung open. Um, some of the side chains have rearranged as well, and you can see those in the event map. And then this ligand has kind of wedged itself into this new pocket very nicely. And we're only able to, we're only able to model this through, uh, through the event maps. Uh, the last example, uh, we have some, the ground state of our protein, again, has an ethylene glycol on the binding site and a couple of waters. This ligand that we identify really, really uh, kind of matches the shape and position of these uh, molecules, which is not particularly surprising. Um, you can imagine that the, the, the energetic hotspots for the ends of this ethylene glycol could well be similar to the energetic hotspots here and here. Uh, and the only reason this was detected was due to a sulfur in this five-membered ring over here, uh, generating a lot of signal in the Z map. Um, and what's most interesting is that when you look at this, you can clearly see that this ring is in two conformations. Uh, so none of this guessing, is it or not, is it not in alternate conformations, you can often very, very clearly see, uh, even for a partial occupancy ligand when it's in uh, multiple conformations. Uh, 
So we've uh, been able to identify all of these ligands and model them in the Z maps and the event maps. Now we want to refine them. Uh, and we can very quickly hit a problem um, because refinement of partial occupancy ligands is difficult. We can't just take the ligand and refine it um, because as you can see in this example down here, even though it's very clearly defined in the event map, if you look at the two FOFC, so this is for the full crystal, again, uh, contour to quite a low level, not 0.5 RMSD, there, there's almost no indication that the ligand is there at all. Um, and so in this case, it's because the superposed state, so 77% of the crystal uh, has some water molecules here marked with arrows, and we need to include these in our model if we're able to do this. Uh, sorry, if we're able, if we intend to refine the model. So. Um, it should also be noticed, uh, noted, a lot of people say, oh, I've refined my ligand and it doesn't appear in the electron density. Um, Panda is not solving a phase problem. These ligands are not, not visible because of phases. They are not visible because they are partial occupancy. Um, of course, you might get some changes in the density afterwards due to improved phases, but ligands should not appear in the maps after refinement, unless, of course, your phases were dreadful to begin with. Uh, quickly use some science conclusion slides before I move on to the uh, usage slides. Um, hopefully I've convinced you that conventional maps do not in general represent minor states of your crystal. Uh, this causes a lot of difficulties in interpretation um, and of course creates possibilities for people to make errors in modeling. Um, and in general, they are not suitable for identifying or indeed modeling partial occupancy features. Uh, I've introduced two types of maps. So in this case, Z maps and event maps. Uh, and we can use Z maps to objectively identify features in a crystal, uh, very similarly to the way that FOFO maps uh, used to be used, and in some cases still are. Uh, and this gives us statistical confidence that we've actually seen uh, a change state in our crystal. Uh, and then the second map, the background corrected event map, um, simulates what would happen if the feature was kind of present at full occupancy in the ligand uh, in the crystal. Uh, and this allows us to model weak features. Uh, so it undoes the averaging um, to reveal the, the change state clearly. Uh, using, using this method, we can identify some uh, very interesting scientific things, such as when, our, when we've made labeling errors. Um, and so we can rescue this data set that would previously have had to be thrown away because we couldn't interpret it. Um, you, can, you can observe some very cool dynamics in a crystal, such as this helix opening uh, in order to accommodate a binding ligand. And if your ligand is actually disordered, um, it's often very, very clearly uh, shown in the density. But most importantly, what Panda allows us to do is use control experiments in crystallography. Um, and it identifies bound data sets purely by contrasting them against unbound data sets. Uh, and I kind of pretty strongly believe that FOFO maps or Z maps, which use control data sets, are the only way to be confident that of an event having happened in your crystal. Um, and so therefore, if we're trying to identify signal as scientists, we should use control data sets that actually give us a statistical measure of when something has happened. Um, before I go on to the practicalities, I don't know whether there were any questions, whether this would be a good time to answer some of them. There was one I could, uh, <clears throat> I can pass on the, um, the resolution here, the, uh, what is the lowest resolution that you've tried that still works to identify ligands? Uh, so the lowest one I know of is that um, the, the fragment screen I mentioned, which was 2.7 angstroms. I believe they've got a couple around there, maybe a little bit lower. Um, but the, the problem is, as soon as you go down in, uh, in resolution, your data become more imprecise, and therefore you need a, a stronger change for it to be significant in the Z-maps. Uh, and of course, that means normally that your ligand has to be bound at higher occupancy. Um, which, which once you get down to a certain resolution, basically means you can only identify 100% um, occupancy ligands, which is of course where this is no longer necessary. Um, so not really to answer the question because it will vary from system to system, but there is a, to a certain extent a fundamental limit to the, to the method. And I, I wouldn't expect it to work below three angstroms currently. I had a question which was uh, sort of uh, an idea about it's not ligands per se, but one area where people are using difference maps a lot and they have a decent sort of ground state is uh, in time resolved X ray crystallographic experiments where people are looking at difference maps and it's complicated because you have 
atoms moving out of density and then atoms moving back into that density. So things get, have people uh, approached you with your your ideas about uh, uh, you know event maps for these sorts of situations? A, a few people have approached me and uh, they have basically said, yeah, that should work. They'll often try it. Um, haven't actually heard anything back from them. So either it worked amazingly and they're writing up the papers or it didn't work at all and no one told me. Um, I mean, there are a few examples where uh, kind of closer collaborators have tried things and it hasn't worked, but those ones are, are not particularly surprising. Um, I don't know if anyone has actually tried it for a kind of a true uh, time resolved experiment, but we, we certainly were interested in doing that in the future. Great. Well, with that, we can uh, push forward with the practicalities. Okay. Uh, so Pandas is available within CSP4. Um, it's technically installable from outside, but I, I would heavily suggest you to kind of just use it within CSP4 or wherever you get your CSP4 from. Um, it, it's composed of three main programs, the, the Panda itself, which is Panda Analyze, which is used to analyze the data, uh, Panda Inspect, which is used for um, going through the results and modeling your ligands, uh, and then Panda Export, which basically kind of takes all of these structures that you've modeled and puts them into a refolder that enables you to refine them. When it comes to refining uh, the multi-state models, um, there are several command line tools I'm going to quickly go through here, so, uh, so I won't name them now. Um, if you are completely allergic to command line tools, the, the only available uh, thing at the moment is Xchem Explorer, which is the GUI that they use uh, at Diamond um, for the fragment screening. So if you're interested in that, uh, go to this web address, uh, and it's uh, published in this paper as well. The uh, process that we go through in Panda uh, is outlined here. I'm going to go through each of these in more detail in different slides, so don't worry if it doesn't make sense now. Um, but basically, we have to prepare the data, analyze it, do all the modeling, and then we come out of Panda. We have to generate uh, models for refinement, which are superpositions between the ligand and the unbound state. Um, we then need to generate some restraints. Uh, we then refine them, and then we can look at validation, etc. kind of more normal stuff. Um, and then when it comes to remodeling, you have to split the ligand and the ground states uh, back into two individual structures, do any more remodeling, uh, merge them again, and re-refine. Or, of course, if you're lucky, then you can just deposit. Uh, for Panda Analyze, the, uh, the input to the program is pairs of PDBs and MTZs. Uh, so we collect multiple uh, crystal structures, the same kind of crystal form, and then you have a PDB and an MTZ for each of them. Currently, all of the crystals do need to be the same space group, um, of course, looking into variations and uh, reducing that restriction in the future. Um, one of the more kind of subtle things you need to do is make sure every MTZ has a complete set of reflections, for instance, using Uniqify. Uh, this means that when you refine it, the missing uh, FO reflections are uh, filled in, basically, in the 2FOFC map with FC. Um, and this prevents kind of issues when you're subtracting Fourier series, if you have a missing reflection in one data set but not in another. Um, and then the other thing you need to be aware of during processing is that we normally just refine the same structure, so a reference structure, against each data set, similar to the way you use automated pipelines at the synchrotron. Uh, and so in this case, we've mostly used Dimple, which is very, very simple uh, MR, and then a few cycles of restrained refinement on each derivative data set. All of these things, um, kind of wrapped into this little script which I wrote which is bundled with pandas so you just give it all of, uh, you give it a, a reference PDB for the crystal form a uh, pile of MTZs and it will go off and do all of these processes and run refinements on all of them uh, once you've once you've done that you can uh, arrange your data sets into folders um, I would suggest using one folder for each data set although it's technically possible to put them all in the same folder I just wouldn't uh, so you can run Panda Analyze, uh, point it to the right directory. The star here obviously tells it pick up all the folders in this directory, um, tell it what the PDB file looks like in each of the directories, uh, and then the MTZ, if you don't tell it what that looks like, it'll assume that it looks the same as the PDB but with .mtz after it, and tell it where you want it to go. And using this folder system, it will automatically label our data sets, in this case, JMJD2DA, uh, crystal in what, 304 here, uh, and this is the, the uh, files that are in each of the dataset folders. We've got the output from Dimple, um, and you can also dump the ligand SIF files for this crystal, the, the ones that have been added, maybe, or anything. Uh, and if you 
call your ligand CIF file and your ligand PDB the same thing. It will find all CIF files in a folder and uh, copy those to the Panda folder. It doesn't use any information about the ligands, as I've said, so it's it's completely objective and kind of unable to be subjective. Um, but this comes uh, very useful when you're turning to modeling the, the bound data sets. Um, when, we're, when we're providing data sets to Panda, we want to let it know how it should treat each of the data sets. Um, so we, we, in a lot of cases, we want to tell it which are the ones that do not contain ligands and which are therefore ground state crystals, uh, which are crystals where the ligand is not bound, and then therefore contain a set of APO confirmations, possibly more than one. Um, and we can tell Panda that these, these are the ground state data sets by giving it a comma separated string of the, uh, the data set labels from, that it picked up from the folder names. Uh, and if you give it a set of ground state data sets, it'll only use those for calculating the average map and doing the statistical characterization. Uh, for conventional ligand screens, um, you could, for instance, imagine connecting some APO crystals as a baseline, providing them in the ground state data sets uh, tag. You want to make sure all of your crystals are in the same condition for a good panda analysis, and the only difference should, between data sets should be the presence of a ligand or another perturbation. Uh, one of the things that we really do kind of worry about is if your ligand is solubilized in DMSO and you're then adding your ligand to your ligand bound crystals, you need to make sure you also add DMSO to your ground state crystals because you can imagine that if DMSO binds here, it will appear uh, in all of these data sets, even though it's not actually your interesting ligand. Um, and this is the case for fragment screening at Diamond, but for most blind screening experiments, uh, when you average over all of the data sets, it just looks like the ground state anyway. But basic laws of large numbers, you've got 200 data sets, um, only a couple of them bind, uh, so therefore you, uh, the average just looks like the 200 unbound ones. But if you, if you want to kind of run it in discovery mode, you run it once, you identify some bound ligands, you then rerun it, but now excluding these from characterization, so that therefore it will use everything else as a ground state data set. Um, instructions for doing this kind of thing are, can be found on the Panda uh, website which I will, is, uh, covers hopefully most of the things in this talk, but if it doesn't, email me and I will put something up. Um, the common question for Panda is how many data sets do I need? So if we, we did some uh, uh, characterization of the method and actually surprisingly, and also not surprisingly, it requires about 30 data sets to fully converge the statistical model. And that's mainly due to the uh, convergence of this variation between crystals um, statistic and that that scares a lot of people but actually this uh, statistic is only really useful for kind of suppressing noise in variable areas such as crystal contacts um, and so therefore it's often some of the least interesting parts of your crystal um, and if you're only interested in your binding site then you can certainly use fewer data sets so we, we found it works well with about five ground state data sets um, from anecdotal evidence uh, and it's indeed possible to do it with one data set if you have a fairly kind of clean data, um, and in that case, it's almost directly comparable to an FOFO map uh, for the for the Z map identification. Uh, Panda Analyze um, doesn't just give you a log file. Uh, it puts some effort into making it give you pretty HTML summaries, so that it gives you things like some summary histograms of the, the distribution of your R3s and your high resolution limits over your crystals, um, as well as overlaying all of the Wilson plots for all your data sets. Um, enable you to identify things like this one where you can see that there's lots of nasty ice rings that have been integrated into some of these data sets. Um, and then it also gives you a summary of every ligand that you've fitted uh, once you start modeling in Panda Inspect. Um, gives you a kind of a summary up at the top for how many have you fitted ligands to, how many haven't you looked at yet, and how many have you identified as not actually being ligands, um, and lots of other things. Uh, one of the nice things I hope is that it gives you a, an idea of where event, events have been identified uh, and condenses them into these into these graphs. And then as you go through and model them, it colors the bar green if you've said I've modeled a ligand here, and it colors the bar red if you uh, say that this actually wasn't interesting. So you can see the distribution of fragments over your protein. When it comes, so once you've looked at the results of, in, in, of uh, panda.analyze, you can go and run panda inspect. Um, so it, it basically takes you on a guided tour of your results uh, in a custom Coop GUI. Um, you simply go into the Panda folder and run Panda Inspect from the card line. Uh, from the card line. Um, it will, for each event that it's identified, it will load the structure at the correct point and load up the Z map and the event map. 
um, and then you just need to do normal modeling. So it, the, the input model, which is whatever you gave to the program, um, you delete waters that aren't there in the event map, or you move them, or you remodel your side chains, um, as I've covered here. Um, and these instructions are all found on the uh, on the Panda website as well. So you just normal normal modeling to the event map, nothing particularly uh, exciting or special. Uh, so this is what the GUI actually looks like. Um, so when it opens, you have your Z map and your event map, uh, the model that you provided to Panda. If you've provided a ligand, it will dump that in the middle of the screen, and you can see here that I've already fitted it to the density. Um, the next thing to do, of course, would be to click Merge Ligand with Model, uh, and then you can save your model uh, and go to the next. So these are the navigation buttons between the events. You can also jump between sites, uh, even jump between data sets. Um, this contains, this down here on the left, contains information about your data set. Uh, so this is event one for this particular data set called BAS2BA uh, 538. Um, resolution, this is the error in each data set, the R3 and the R work, so nice summary statistics. Uh, you can record comments about this event, such as really nice bound ligand. Um, you can say, is it interesting? Did I place a ligand in this place? Uh, and what is my confidence that, I, that this model is high quality? Uh, you can also record information about this site, so you could call it main binding site, for example. Uh, if you want to know what the original 2FOFC maps look like, you can click this button. Uh, if you want to know what the ground state map looked like for this crystal at this site, you can load this one. Uh, and if you want to kind of reset the model to before you were um, modeling, you can load this one for comparison, or you can in fact just click reset if you've done a really bad job of modeling it. Great. So once you've been through all these, you can, so we'd model this, we'd click merge, we'd click save, go to the next one, repeat the process again, uh, not do all of your modeling preferably. Uh, and then once you're ready for refinement, you go to Panda export. Um, the, pa the Panda folder structure after Panda.analyze is not particularly useful. So what we want to do is pull out all of the structures in the MTZ so that we can run refinement. Um, so just run this command. It will dump everything into this new folder, pull out the structures, the crystallographic data, uh, and the map files that you use for modeling. And then we can get on with refinement. Um, so as I mentioned before, we need to build multi-state ensemble models in order to deal with our partial occupancy ligands. Uh, so very quickly, I want to look at the way we normally do um, ligand modeling in crystallography. So when you come across a binding site that a ligand has bound to in a crystallographic data set, the first thing you do is delete everything in that binding site. You then model your ligand, and we then use that model in refinement. And this is certainly supported by a study we did of the PDB, so we extracted all non-redundant ligands in the PDB, uh, and we found that 92% of them are modeled at 100% occupancy. So we are asserting that our ligand is bound in every single copy of the crystal, and there, there is no other, um, no other state present at that site. Of course, that's an approximation in a lot of cases to simplify modeling and also to, to prevent using an overcomplicated model. Um, but even where people do start to refine the occupancy of their ligand, they're still not modeling a superposed state. And this is very unlikely to actually represent the situation in the crystal. Uh, most worryingly, there's some actually some ligands in the PDB that are more than 100% there. Um, not quite sure how that's physically possible, but maybe it's a very exciting paper. So how do we actually uh, do, do modeling in Panda? Um, as I said before, the normal modeling procedure doesn't work particularly well. But fortunately, we, we already know what the ground state is from previous experiments or indeed from our ground state data sets. Um, so what we do is we use the ground state as the starting structure when we, when we do refinement before we do Panda. Uh, and then what we do is we just take that input state into the program and merge it with the model that you build into the event maps. And that, that very nicely builds us an ensemble model of our, of our binding site. Um, so using all the power of addition. Um, and for, for particular details on how we do the merging, you can uh, either go to the web page or indeed go to the web page and then follow the link to this PDF uh, where I go through how we merge these models because it's not as trivial as you might seem. Uh, and the script to do this is called giant merge confirmations, uh, ground state and then bound state and then some options. Um, to, to give an example of why these are, work quite well, uh, this is the example of the ligand that was misidentified with the bromine. Um, the event map clearly shows the, the ligand state only. Um, but if we just refine the ligand, it doesn't look particularly good in our 2FOFC maps. Um, but if we merge in the background state from the uh, ground state data sets, uh, you get a very, very nice model with very negligible difference density at about 40% occupancy. Uh, 
Um, if you're interested more in this particular example and some other examples, this was published in Acta D last year. Um, once we have generated a multi-state model, uh, if, you, if you go and read that PDF or the, the web page to explain how I do the merging, um, we need to generate a lot of restraints to try and reduce the number of parameters in our model. Um, the easiest one to understand, of course, is the occupancy of the different conformations. We want all those to be the same, uh, so we want to generate a set of constraints. Um, but also to maintain model connectivity, I need to duplicate a lot of residues um, to maintain the correctness of the model and prevent it, does, to prevent it from exploding in refinement. Uh, and these are all nicely wrapped into this script giant.make restraints, which you just give it the multi-state uh, PDB and it will spit out a couple of parameter files. And then to use these very easily, I generate a quick script, which is just a wrapper. Um, you give it the PDB, the MPZ, and this restraints file, and it will uh, unsurprisingly do refinement. Um, and hopefully a nice feature for some people, it supports both Phoenix and RefMac, um, although it only simple refinements, you don't have the full, uh, you don't have the full um, options of those, those programs. So you're not necessarily about to access the full power, but for, for most kind of crystallographic fragment screening experiments, which are high resolution, it works pretty well. But it is still the developer version, so expect some fine tuning of this restraints file to be necessary. And again, that's the link to the PDF explaining what we do. Uh, once we've, of course, refined our structure, we need to validate it. Um, it's no longer, as I said, possible to in any way validate your model by looking at it. Um, so we, we use a combination of five quality metrics. So the RSCC, the real space correlation coefficient, uh, calculates the similarity between the model and the density. Uh, we use the two statistical um, real space z-score metrics from Ian Tickle, uh, which looks at the statistical measure of the difference density over our model and also the strength of the density under our model. Uh, as to whether we would kind of expect it to have a certain amount of density. Uh, we also look whether the ligand moved in refinement, because um, that's obviously, a, we want the refinement to be stable, and if it's not stable, that's not a good sign. Um, and we also look at the B factor ratio of the ligand to the surrounding residues, uh, which is also a nice measure of whether refinement is going well. Uh, and again, the details of this are published at this paper. Uh, and you can call it very quickly, very easily by running giant.score model, and then the PDB and the MTZ from refinement. The output of this program uh, plots a radar plot, um, where if their scores are good, sorry, if the scores are good, it plots them in the center of the plot, uh, and as they get worse, they move out uh, towards the edges. So here, this ligand, although partial occupancy, scores really well, really high correlation coefficient, um, doesn't move in refinement, has low B factors compared to the surroundings, or similar B factors to the surroundings, uh, lots of density for it, uh, and uh, not very much difference density. Um, this ligand, however, uh, has not as much density as we would like to see for it, and has high, very high B factors. And this is indicative of an imbalance between the B factors and occupancy, so possibly lower the occupancy of this ligand, um, and it, the B factors will go down in refinement uh, and hopefully lead to a better model. But suppose after refinement you need to remodel your protein. Remodeling uh, multi-state superpositions is an absolute nightmare because it's very difficult to see which atom belongs to which conformation. So I wrote a script called giant.split conformations, which takes these and splits them, unsurprisingly. So we now have the ground state, which we can remodel into a ground state map. And we have the uh, bound state, which we can remodel into the event maps to see if it's moved and uh, to validate it, see if it's moved in refinement. And then of course, once we've got them uh, happy, we can re-merge them into it using giant.merge, uh, regenerate the restraints and rerun refinement um, until we're very, very happy and we can then deposit. Um, as I mentioned, XCAN Explorer is available, and this is kind of where it really comes into its own, um, because we're constantly loading up multiple maps, multiple data sets, multiple structures, and we want to save them in a kind of a, a, a structured way. Um, so if you are doing this, I think it is probably a good idea to do it through XCAN Explorer, which will automatically load the 2FOFC map for the full data set, um, but also the event maps for the location and the two structures that you can then uh, edit and to modify into the right maps, and then with one click, send it back off for refinement. Uh, this slide contains a quick summary of whatever of everything I've just said. Um, so we start off with preparing our data, then running the Panda pipeline. Um, then once we've got our models, we merge them, uh, we make restraints for them, we refine them, we, uh, we validate the models, possibly going back and doing this again, uh, and then splitting confirmations to make them interpretable and also modelable. This one is also very interesting uh, for chemists because they don't care about the ground state. 
the interesting scientific output is actually the bound state of the protein. So by running giant.split confirmations, you can uh, create an interpretable structure for the end user, which is, after all, often a chemist. Uh, once more, I very quickly mentioned XChem Explorer, uh, which enables you to do all of these things. Uh, so it enables a quick um, a review of all the diffraction data you've collected for, in this, in, in our case, fragment screening, uh, enables you to process all the diffraction data, um, and enables to do the initial refinements, uh, which, so for instance, dimple in my case, uh, run hit identification, and then also run pan inspect for modeling and refinement. Uh, and under the hood, it's using the scripts that I've been through today. Um, and then it also, in a very nice way, packages the results uh, to allow you to deposit them in the PDB. Last couple of slides. Um, I've mentioned it several times, but please check out the website. Uh, any comments or uh, additions, please send me an email and I'll uh, chuck something up there if it's not up there already. Um, but finally, I just wanted to thank everyone that's uh, ever been involved in this project. Um, certainly wouldn't have been possible on my own. Uh, and indeed, it's now being taken up by new PhD students in Frank's group. Um, and thank you very much for listening. Great, thank you very much. <clears throat> if uh, people have questions, you can send them by chat. I can also unmute folks who uh, might want to ask their questions directly. Um, we had a few, and uh, it sounds like it might be a specific case here, so um, I might be able to unmute Christopher and he can ask directly, but the uh, can one apply uh, Panda to multiple ligand orientations at symmetry sites? So uh, are you limited when you're comparing these things? Yeah, so the uh, if the ligand is in multiple conformations, um, Panda cannot separate those conformations out into individual maps. Um, so if the, lig the the example I showed had a ring in two conformations, um, and that one's kind of resolvable, but there's no way to separate those out, the symmetry axis is an extreme example of a ligand in kind of two conformations. So unfortunately, you can never undo that averaging, uh, at least not with Panda in its current state. It might theoretically be possible, um, but certainly not at the moment. And then uh, one other case here is, um, are, is there any way to get around the situation where maybe APO state crystals are not obtainable? So you have lots of ligands, or you have um, maybe derivatives and, and crystals with, uh, but the, the APO states sometimes are too floppy, and so. Um, um, it would be possible to, so if you were doing derivatives, certainly you could use your smallest derivative. So let's say all the derivatives are basically the same uh, core structure with extra bits stuck on. Um, if you said the, the, if you had a structure of the core structure, you could use that as your ground state and then Panda would be basically identifying whether anything had been added on to the ligand in the crystal, um, which would hopefully identify your derivatives. Um, yep. I don't see any reason why that shouldn't work. Great. Any other questions? Uh, Nick, thank you very much. This looks like a really exciting tool, particularly for ligand screening, but also I can think of other other ways to uh, to treat electron density where you would be able to pull out these small, you know, changes or like minor uh, these these low occupancy states. So uh, it's exciting yep. to see and. Um, uh, it's in CCP4. If uh, for those of you who are on the call, give it a try. Let us know how it goes. And yep. again, and if thank you're, you very much. If you, if anyone has any tricky data sets, uh, feel free to drop me an email. Um, internet uh, has my email address. Great. Thank you everyone for joining, and uh, take care. <laughs>